All right, everybody, greetings. Welcome once again to the Rec Poker Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Fredland. And as always, we are sponsored by Running Aces, Racetrack, and Casino. This is episode 130. And I'm excited that we have Andrew Brokus from the Thinking Poker Podcast, thinkingpoker.net. Uh, just a fantastic poker mind. He is with us tonight. And so uh, I'm going to air the um, the interview and the hand discussion that we did with Andrew. A couple of quick announcements. Uh, we're almost done, crazy like a fox, almost at the end here, uh, and excited about some opportunities that are coming our way for some potential new interactive training things, so stay tuned for that. Go to recpokertraining.com. You can sign up for the newsletter. I send out emails every few weeks, so you can stay touched, uh, uh, aware of what's going on there and stay in touch that way. Uh, we recorded this one prior to the end of the week of May 12th, so I don't have a running aces player of the week standing so once we get caught up or we're doing things more real time uh, i'll provide those for you so you'll have to wait in here uh, wait and find out or go to at run aces on twitter uh, or on facebook and figure that deal out and again patreon if that's something you want to do support what we're doing with rec poker podcast i would love to have your support out there for as little as a dollar a month just kind of a way to go at a boy uh, keep up the good work and pro provide free content whenever you can that's kind of what the message is that's sent there. Uh, so I want to introduce the interview with Andrew Brokus, the hand discussion. Uh, Andrew is a very, very solid player, uh, 780000 in lifetime earnings. He's primarily focusing on the business side of things, the coaching side of things, uh, but he has had uh, four World Series of Poker caches each of the last two years. He's also, it's also interesting, you'll hear more about this in the interview, but uh, five out of the six years uh, of first playing the main event, uh, he cashed. And he actually had some big caches, including uh, finishing 35th for 193,000, 53rd for 160,000, 87th for 80,000, uh, and all five caches totaled more than $500,000. Uh, so a fantastic start to his main event career. Now he has gone over the last seven, but he's still five for 13 with 500,000 in caches on an investment of uh, a 13 tourney. So uh, that's still pretty good. Uh, still netted about 370 grand out of that deal. So uh, let's let's uh, join the conversation with Andrew uh, right now. Uh, well, everybody, uh, welcome once again. Uh, as promised, we're here with Andrew Brokus and uh, a few of the rec players who will be uh, questioning Andrew as we go. Uh, but Andrew, let me just start by saying, first of all, thank you very much uh, for taking the time to be with us. Thank, thanks for having me. I'm a, I'm a little intimidated to be questioned. I feel like I'm on a trial or something. Well, it's not so much questioned as much as it is being grilled. Um, grilled, so, okay. <laughs> yeah, if that, makes, if that makes you feel better. No, well, better, thank you. Yeah, no, kind of what, what we've learned, uh, at least the, the niche that we're filling with the people that are engaged, is that there's a lot of tremendous content out there that's uh, it's kind of one-way content and it's great to consume. Uh, but, but we're really about, you know, how do we learn this thing in community? How do we be able to ask questions and make it interactive? So that's why uh, we do more of a panel discussion. So uh, we're, we're all pretty good guys. We won't be too hard on you. No, I, I think that's great. I mean, I think like it's obviously I have, uh, I, don't know, I shouldn't say obviously, but I, I have my own podcast and, and when I do coaching, a lot of the coaching that I do, I try to make very like conversational. I mean, often it's me trying to put questions back to people, but yeah, I, I think there's uh, definitely something to that, that you learn more from the sort of like back and forth of a conversation than you do from a lecture for sure. For sure. At least, you know, there's different learning styles. And for me, that's certainly my learning style is to be able to ask questions. Well, let's, no, let's talk about right. <laughs> talk, talk a little bit about uh, about all you have going. We got I've got thinking poker, and it gives some of our folks that are listening may not be familiar with you, but they should be. So they, why don't they you? Uh, and they thinking should. thinking poker is the place to start. So the, the thinking poker podcast is the funnest and freest way to hear more from me, um, and you can find that at thinkingpoker.net, and that's uh, exactly what it sounds like. It's a it's a podcast. We do it once a week. We've been doing it for I guess we're coming up on seven years now. Seven years in September. Um, so we're coming up on 300 episodes. I have a co-host, Nate Mavis, and we, uh, we have usually a, a strategy segment. I'm sure not as uh, rigorous as what you guys are, are doing here. Um, and then we also, most episodes, we have a guest where you know, we, we try to get a slice of the poker life. You talk, I mean, sometimes it's, it's famous people you've heard of. I think a lot of our most interesting episodes are people that you've never heard of before. But, uh, you know, if you've never heard of them, there's a reason we have them on the show. <laughs> um, and it's just interesting people. I mean, we talked to one guy who uh, played poker in prison, just sort of um, 
aspects of the poker world that you might not hear about elsewhere is our, uh, is our aspiration. Yeah, it's fantastic. And, you know, I've been able to listen to a bunch of them, not all of them, I, I admit, but I've listened to a bunch of them uh, over the years. And I've had a number of people uh, either on Twitter or saying, you know, can you somehow get Andrew on the show? Because they just love your podcast and how you think about the game. And, and it's an entertaining podcast as well. So, uh, c- uh, you know, kudos to you on all that you have going there. Thanks a lot. All right. Well, let's, uh, did you bring a couple of hands with you by any chance? Um, I definitely have some stuff we could uh, we could talk about. I might just need one second to, to oh, that's pull fine. it up. Yeah, whatever whatever you want to share. Okay. Um, you might have some of your biggest fans here that are listening right now that are on the panel too. Just FYI, Rob, Rob, you want to <laughs> say, say anything to Andrew? Andrew, it's just a pleasure to be able to talk to you. I've been listening. I think I've listened to every single episode of wow. Thinking Poker. I went back as far as I could anyway when I first found discovered you. I'm, I'm impressed. That's a lot of hours. That well, I I have a 45 minute commute to and from work, so that's when I'm listening. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's rough. I I don't envy people with long commutes. <laughs> yeah, and I want to say thank you to Andrew too for making sure that Rob's game doesn't get any better. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's cold. <laughs> oh, Rob is a very, very solid player. <laughs> well, not to be outdone by Rob, but I want to mention that I started listening to your podcast when you were still in the single digits on the podcast. Oh, wow. And I'm, I'm impressed there as well. That's a long time. Yeah. Well, and uh, your podcast was the first one that let me understand what it meant to think in terms of ranges. You know, I'd heard that before, but I didn't really understand what it meant. I'm not sure I've actually accomplished the ability to do that, but I at least know what people mean when they say it now. Wow, well, that's high praise. And it's also a good segue, actually, to uh, the the first hand that I've got here. Um, And this one, actually, so I I didn't uh, plug this in my introduction, but I should do it now. Um, I have a a book that I'm, it's pretty close to finished. I'm hoping to get out within a a month. Um, So this is one of the examples from that book, which is meant to be, um, all right. So I don't, I don't want to jump straight from from ranges. But where are we on, uh, on 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 game theory, guys? How do we how do we feel about that? What's our level of uh, comfort and familiarity? Are you talking about just playing GTO? Well, just the the like I don't know. What, what what do you think of when I say when I say game theory? What's your yeah well, reaction? I, I'm a math nerd, so I, I go to Nash equilibrium when I start thinking about you know your optimal play where. Uh, you know, game theory optimal to me is really about making sure that you cannot be exploited versus exploitive play is really about trying to exploit other players. So you're kind of figuring out what's the, what's the right way to play. And for, for us, I think uh, most of the recreational players we play in situations where I think playing pure GTO would be leaving money on the table because sure. there's so many mistakes that are made. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think what we've talked about is just having a good understanding, a good grounding of GTO theory and GTO ranges and GTO plays, I think is a, is a great foundational piece. And then from there, uh, being able to branch out and try to look for spots to be exploited. I guess that's how I think about it. I couldn't have said it better myself. And that's exactly what this book is, is meant to be. Is I, I thought about it. I mean, this, this is far too long to be a title. But if, if, I, if I could ignore length, the title would be something like uh, Game Theory for People Who Think They Don't Need Game Theory, or something along those lines. It, it's, it's meant to uh, deliver exactly that kind of foundational. Like, I think in order to play exploitively, to do that well, you need to have an understanding of what the equilibrium would look like. Um, you know, other, otherwise, how can you recognize that your opponent is, is making a mistake? I mean, other, you, you're maybe making an assumption that you think he's uh, calling too much. But, I mean, there might also be other spots. Uh, you know, it, it's one thing to say, oh, my opponent calls too much on the river, and it's kind of obvious what to do about that. Um, but there might be other, like, would you be capable of recognizing if an opponent is betting too much on the turn? And, hmm. you know, would you know what exploit to take if he is doing that? Uh, I mean, I, I definitely feel like, and I've always strived to play exploitively. I mean, I could probably count on one hand the number of times that, you know, I've really tried to um, play a truly unexploitable style. But I found that studying game theory opened my eyes to a lot of new potential exploits, uh, you know, things where I was doing something that was exploitive, but 
it wasn't a deliberate choice. It wasn't like I was saying, okay, I see this mistake my opponent is making, and now I'm doing this thing to take advantage of him. I had just learned certain things. I mean, I think continuation betting is a good example. Like the idea that you should just, if you raise preflop, you should automatically bet the flop. Um, I mean, that was kind of a specific exploit based on how people were playing and like, was it 2006 or whenever uh, Harrington right. was, 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 was the Harrington book? Yeah, Dan Harrington. Yeah, and it's, I yeah. mean, that exploits people who are calling too much pre flop and giving up too easily on the flop. And there are still people who play that way, but when you're dealing with opponents who are much better, uh, I mean, now that we have access to stuff like GTO solvers, we can look at specific situations and say that, like, actually, there's many spots where the solver as the pre flop raiser is betting less than 50% of the time. And you might say, okay, my opponents are, they're, they're sort of exploitable. They're a little too loose, blah, blah, blah. Are you really making a conscious decision? Like, are you sure that you should be just betting 100% of the time? You know, is, is, is there really supposed to be that big of a golf between how you're playing against your opponents and what the play against a, uh, a sort of ideal opponent would be? Probably not. So I think being prompted like that to think, oh, some of the stuff that we've taken as received wisdom in the poker world is probably flat out wrong and then we need to rethink some of our intuitions uh, I, I think that's a pretty big deal so how does the book if you don't mind me kind of talking about the book a little bit then so what sort of the you know it's game theory for those who don't think they need game theory is it what sort of the uh, kind of the undergirding is it is it analytical research or what sort of the um, I built it around toy games are kind of going back and forth between toy games, which is a term I guess not everyone's going to be familiar with that. Uh, people may have heard of like the ace king queen game, which is the, the idea of a toy game is that it's a very simplified version of something that looks similar to poker. So the ace king queen game is a game where there's, it's a three card deck. There's one ace, one king, one queen in the deck, and there's two players and each player gets dealt one card. So, you know, you're either dealt an ace or you're dealt a king or you're dealt a queen. And whichever one you're dealt, you know your opponent didn't get that one. So if you have a queen, you know he's got either a king or an ace. And the only objective of this game is just to show down the high card. There's no draws. There's no da-da-da. There's just, you know, there's a bet and you can call or fold and then you see who has the better card. And that right there, I mean, it's a highly simplified version of poker, but it is poker. And there are some plays where you know, the correct thing to do is obvious. Like if you have an ace, which is the nuts and somebody bets, you know, it's pretty obvious that you should call. And if you have a queen and somebody bets, it's pretty obvious that you should fold. But there's also some decisions that are more complicated than that. Like you have a queen, you can't possibly win by checking. You're not going to make your opponent fold an ace if you bet. But if he has a queen, or sorry, if he has a king, right? He has like a, a sort of medium strength hand, a, a bluff catcher, we might call it. If he has a king, um, he might fold it because mm -hmm. he'd worry that you might be betting with an ace. And so you know, when we say like, oh, I want to play exploitably against my opponents, um, you don't always know what the exploit is. You know, if you're playing against a player in this game, you have no way of knowing whether that player is going to call with a king or fold a king or do anything in between. And likewise, if you're the player holding a king and your opponent bets, it's not always obvious what the right play is. And I think that comes up in real poker too. I mean, it's, it's great to do exploitive things when you know how to exploit your opponent, but I think we've all been in situations where you're facing a bet and you're like, geez, I have no idea what he's doing here. I've, I don't know what this bet is. It might be a value bet. It might be a bluff. I don't know. I have no idea how to range him. You know, like we have to make decisions like that sometimes when we don't, it's not obvious what the right play is. So yeah, I mean, if, if you see a situation where you can say, I know how to exploit this player, absolutely go ahead and do that. And then, you know, Game theory doesn't tell you not to. Game theory is a tool that you can use or not use. And it's a tool that's helpful in these situations where uh, where the play isn't obvious. So we start with a really simple game like the ace-king-queen game. And I show you mathematically how to kind of solve that game or, or find a solution um, for that game that enables you to make the best of it. When uh, you know, It's not about playing perfectly because you don't know what your opponent's going to do, but it's about making the best decision that you can given that uncertainty. Uh, and then we kind of go back and forth from that to, okay, so what are the implications? What lessons can we take from this game? And then apply those to actual hold'em situations. And then we'll look at a more complicated game. What if the game, what if the deck instead has 10 cards in it from an ace through a five? Otherwise, it's the same rule. So if you're dealt an ace, you know your opponent doesn't have an ace. But now this is more complicated. You know, obviously we can value bet an ace. Probably we can value bet a king. 
Is a queen good enough to value bet? Is a jack good enough to value bet? Does it make a difference whether or not you're in position in terms of whether you can value bet those hands? So as the games get more complicated, they start to look a little bit more like real poker. And again, we go back and forth and look at what are the lessons that we can learn from that game? How can we apply those to, uh, to real poker situations? Interesting. Yeah, that, sounds, that sounds really good. That come, you said it comes out in about a month or so? That, that's what I'm aiming for. The, the writing is basically finished. Um, the main thing I need to do now is, uh, is settle on a title and get somebody to design a cover. Uh, and I'm not sure how long to expect that to take, but I'm, I'm hoping that I can get it out in, like, you know, around the start of the WSFA. Okay, well, good, good luck to you, sir. Thank you. Oh, speaking of that, real quick, are you going out to the World Series? Are you playing this year? I will. I will be there for the entire summer. Or the entire uh, series, I guess. Now, you guys might, I don't know who okay. knows this, but uh, I was actually looking at your hand and mob stats, uh, and then I, then I read a couple articles on you. But you actually, so the main event, you actually cashed five of the first six years that you played it, and like sure with, with, with total earnings like over 500K in those yes. five caches. And I have not cashed in the seven years since. <laughs> oh, is there a I, I didn't catch that. <laughs> is that right? So you, played, you have played every year, though. I have played every year. Yeah, so I, still- I cashed. The, the very first year I played, 2006, I was not even really a professional poker player at the time. Um, and I mean, I, I was playing online and I had, I mean, I, I knew what I was doing. I had a, a bankroll and I was making some money from it. But I mean, I had, my bankroll was maybe $30,000, like nowhere near, you know, what I need to play a 10K. But this was the year where if you won a satellite on Poker Stars, you had to play it. So after, after that, 2007, they stopped accepting buy-ins from third parties like, um, like poker stars, you know, the, the, so now in 2007 forwards, if you want a satellite on poker stars, they just gave you $10,000 cash and uh-huh. they would give you some incentives to buy in. You know, they will give you an extra thousand dollars if you buy in and you wear a poker stars hat. But in 2006, if you won the seat, you had to play it. You couldn't take cash for it. So, you know, which is like, you know, golden handcuffs. I was like, oh, geez, I guess I have no choice but to play the main event. What a, what a shame. <laughs> so sad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, that was pretty exciting. And then, you know, to cash the first time that I played, obviously it was lucky, but um, it was, was a great shot in the arm for like my confidence and for my bankroll. And then, uh, you know, every year since then, I think it kind of made sense for me to play. But that well, if I, if I do some quick math, even if you went over the last seven, you're still five for 13 taking about 500k out of there with 130k of buy-in. So you're still doing okay in the long run. You're still a little... Four yeah, X, I mean, that's, that's how tournaments go. <laughs> <laughs> Is it, isn't it, though? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, it, it, it can be a long time in between them. For sure. Well, congratulations on the, the five big caches, too. Thank you. So, yeah, so do you have anything ready for us now? Yeah, let's, um, let's we'll, we'll start with, I'll even, I'll, I'll spare you the, any sort of preflop decision because I think that's trivial enough. So oh, let's yeah. just imagine you're in middle position and you have ace-king offsuit. Uh, I mean, I guess we can, I, I think this is pretty clearly a raise. Does anyone want to do anything other than raise? I think we're, we're, we're all agreed for the moment. Okay. So let's, let's uh, skip straight to the flop and we'll, we'll call this, uh, what do you want to make it two five or what, what stakes are we playing here? Uh, you tell us what makes sense for the. For... Right, well, t- two, two five is the example I used in the book. So it'll be easier for me to keep the, the numbers straight. If okay. Most, make. most of us are tournament players or at least that's oh, our okay. emphasis. Uh, but we'll we'll just play it as a cash game, and then we'll kind of talk a little bit about if there's any tournament implications uh, that okay. would change decisions. So we're assuming deep stack cash is what we're talking about here. Hundred big blinds. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. So we open with uh, Ace King offsuit, Ace of Spades, King of Hearts uh, in middle position. We'll call it a three X raise. So you open to fifteen dollars, and you get called by the button. And your read is that the button is uh, loose and passive. Maybe you don't know a lot more specific than that, but like like most live players, he's probably looser than he should be, and he's probably more <laughs> passive than he should be. And so you know your your middle position, and the button calls so your heads up on the flop, and the flop is Ace of Hearts, Nine of Hearts, Six of Diamonds, and you're holding Ace of Spades, King of Hearts. There's about thirty dollars in the pot. What do you want to do? See bet. Okay, how much? Probably. Uh, a quarter to a half pot, somewhere in between there. All right. And what are we looking to accomplish with this bet? We hope to get him to, we're hoping for value. Mm-hmm. Basically, maybe somebody with a couple of hearts or uh, maybe a medium pocket pair. Those are possibilities. I would say there's, there's sweeter value to be had than those. If, if it were up to you, if, uh, let, let's, let's suppose that you're a little nefarious and you're in collision with the dealer and you can choose which two cards you would like your opponent to have in his hand. 
what would you like him to have? Ace, Ace queen. Ace queen. Perfect. So I would say that's the number one hand we should be thinking about. When you have top pair, top kicker, you want to, you know, certainly it's possible your opponent has those other hands that you mentioned, but none of those are worth nearly as much to you as ace queen. You know, when your opponent has a flush draw, you're not even that big of a favorite. Uh, pocket pair is probably not going to play a real large pot with you. Uh, ace queen or you know, some sort of dominated ace, that's, uh, that's what we really want to focus on. So what do you, well, hold on, hold on. When you say I, I, I get that, I totally understand the idea that that's the best hand that our opponent could have for us. Mm-hmm. But when you say that's what we really want to focus on, what do you what do you mean by that? So, are are you saying you know, what, yeah, what do you mean by that? We want to target that hand, or that's the hand we want to focus on? Say more about that. Okay. Um, so if if we're playing exploitively, we are we're not going to worry about being balanced, right? We're we're not going to be thinking about. Um, well, if I do such and such, I'm going to be making it maybe kind of obvious to my opponent what my hand is or something like that. Rather, we're assuming that we can predict to some degree how our opponent is going to play. We can predict certain mistakes that he's likely to make and try to take advantage of those. So what we would want to do here would depend on the opponent's hand. So if we knew for a fact that our opponent had, say, king jack of clubs, a right, hand with really no coordination with this board whatsoever, the best play would be to check. If we knew that our opponent had uh, pocket nines, the best play would be to check and fold. <laughs> and if, if we knew that our opponent had ace-queen, the best play would probably be to bet, maybe to check-raise. Um, so if we're going to make a decision about we want to play exploitively, we want to try to predict what our opponent is going to do and then choose a play that we think is going to take advantage of that, we have to pick some hand or hands to focus on because we don't know what the right play is. I mean, the right play is going to vary depending on what his cards are. So there's always going to be a trade-off. If we bet, we're going to increase the amount of value that we win from, say, a dominated ace or the amount of value that we win from maybe a pocket pair. We're probably going to decrease the amount of money that we win from like king jack of clubs. Because if we checked, King Jack might bluff. Maybe he catches a king or a jack on the next card, and then he's willing to put some money into the pot. So there's always a trade-off. Anytime you do, you, you, you choose to get value from one part of your opponent's range, you're probably giving up on value you could be getting from a different part of his opponent's range. So we have to make a choice. Which part do we want to focus on? Right, and so why do you choose ace-queen? Let's just make it two. Let's not mm-hmm. assume we're crushed. Let's assume you know, it's king, jack, of clubs, versus ace-queen. Why, why do you choose the ace queen versus the, or, you know, a, a dominated ace versus, you know, a complete whiff? This is advice that I give to people to try to keep it simple a little bit. So like the, the really ideal way of doing this, and I know you mentioned being a, a, a math geek, so I'll, I'll give you the, the long form answer here. The really ideal way of doing this is to think of every hand your opponent could possibly have and the EV difference between betting and checking, the expected value difference right. between betting and checking against every single hand in his range, and multiply that by the weighted likelihood of his having each of those hands, and that'll tell you what the best play is, like whether, whether right. you have more EV, betting, or checking. Right. Um, that's a lot to try to do in your head, even for oh, a match for sure. Oh, for sure. <laughs> no, and, and trust me, I'm trying to make the game simple. So sure. I'm just trying to figure out, like, you know, if you, if you decide kind of these are the two chunks that you're thinking about, you know, I can um, see merit, so I think and, you know, even if reason. I don't know, you know, you're just saying, well, are you are you kind of are we always targeting the hand that you get the most value from or like the biggest implied value kind of thing or? Yeah, generally the advice I give people is you want to focus on, well, for, first off, you want to make sure you're focused on a hand where it actually matters what you do. Uh, so, you know, a common mistake might be if, if we like when we have ace king, we picked ace queen because that was a hand that was just like just a notch weaker than ours. So that's a, like a hand that we should expect to get a good amount of value from. Now, if we had an even stronger hand, like let's say we flopped uh, pocket aces here, we probably wouldn't want to pick like pocket nines as the hand to focus on. Because if we manage to cool our opponent that badly, where we have top set and he has middle set, it's probably not going to make any difference what we do. Like on the vast majority of runouts, we're going to get all the money in no matter what. So we don't really need to worry about well, what if he has pocket nines when I have pocket aces? That situation is going to take care of itself. Right. So we would want to pick a different hand to focus on. In the case of ace-king versus ace-queen, I think especially if we're dealing with an overly passive opponent, that situation is probably not going to take care of itself. And it's a really important situation. So the like when he has ace-queen, I, I mean, it is kind of what you said. It's um, our, our, our 
biggest moneymaker. And it turns out that, you know, focusing on ace queen, we sort of also end up focusing on like ace jack and ace 10 and you know, all these other hands. Like the, the best play against ace queen is probably also the best play against ace jack and ace 10. So it's, it's sort of a convenient shorthand. And the, the, the things that those hands have going for them, one, they're, um, they're huge sources of profit. Like we're a much bigger favorite against ace queen than we are against eight seven or jack 10 of hearts. You know, we're, we're going to make a lot more money from ace queen. Um, and, and so that's the, like, that's one reason to focus on that. The other one is just that combinatorically, there's a lot more ways is for the opponent to have an ace even though we're looking at two aces right one on the board one in our hand still there's eight ways he can have ace queen eight ways he can have ace jack eight ways he can have ace 10 there's only one way to have king queen of hearts there's only one way to have king jack of hearts the flush trials just don't add up that quickly or, or you know the, the whiffs like king jack of clubs again they just don't add up as quickly as the um the, the, the dominated aces. And I think if he does have a hand like King Jack of Clubs, we're probably not going to win that much from it no matter what. You know, maybe by checking, we squeeze one small bet at a King Jack, but so, I think we're going to get a lot more from Ace Queen and we want to make sure we make the most of that situation. So I assume you're still, you know, you're still in, in hand ranging mode. You're still kind of including all of the potential hands that you could have in that piece. But when you say targeting, is that what, what I'm hearing or what I'm interpreting that to mean is picking a hand from which you're going to determine the line that you're going to take in that hand. Is that? Yes. Okay. So it's not so much that you're, you know, you're taking the whole hand range and you're also, in, it's ace queen. That's all. I, obviously, you know, that's not what the only thing you could have, but that's I mean, not what we're that, saying. That's, we're a, saying a, that's a trick that I give people to simplify. Yeah. Uh, but it's really simplifying the line that you're going to take. Yes. Even though you're still in your, in your mind, you're still saying, well, here's, here's the range of hands because he could still have ace nine and have two pair or those sorts of things. Sure. Yep. Yep. Okay. Chris, did you have something? Yeah, just a quick. So, Andrew, are, when uh, as the action develops, are you consistently changing that target? Yes, that's a very good question. So, I mean, essentially, I'm as long as he's continuing to play in a way that's consistent with him having ace queen, I'm probably going to keep doing the things that I think are going to maximize my value against ace queen. Now, if like say the turn card were a queen, I would change my target to ace jack because I mean. I mean, they're essentially the same hand until that queen comes anyway. But, um, you know, once he has ace queen, obviously we're not getting value from that anymore. Um, the other thing that might cause me to change my target would be if he did something that were inconsistent with him having ace queen. Like if I bet the flop and he raised and I thought, well, you know, this passive player is probably not just raising with, you know, with ace queen, um, then unfortunately I would have to pretty seriously reconsider how I played the hand because, um, yeah, unfortunately, it looks like he doesn't have the hand that I wanted him to have, and uh, now I'm going to have to reconsider what he might have. Rob, did you have something? No, no. Oh, okay. Just... Or John? I mean, I'm using the mute button as my cue. To... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking basically what you had said, just that this is a way of um, you're kind of optimizing your line for the hands that you can get the most value from which will probably approximate maximizing your EV for the hand over yes. the square range. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Okay. Uh, okay, so we've, we've agreed that we want to bet the flop. Um, yeah. I, I think actually the amount that we bet does not matter terribly much. I, I think people, I mean, it, it matters a little bit, but I think a lot of people fret too much over Oh, should I bet half pot or should I bet 60% pot or 70% pot? You know, if, if you're betting in the situations that you're supposed to be betting, I, I think that's enough to worry about. Um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't fret terribly much over the, the size of your bet right now. I mean, that, that's a small improvement that you can get at some point, but I think making sure that you're you know, betting in the situations where you should be betting and checking in the situations where you should be betting is generally a lot more important than getting the sizing exactly. I mean, you don't want to be way off. You don't want to bet $300 here, but you know. Well, that, that's too bad because we spent uh, 85 consecutive weeks figuring this out and it's 42.8% is the, is the right number. So maybe, <laughs> maybe we, maybe we wasted a lot of our Study time. Maybe we shouldn't have done well, that. Mostly you wasted it because there's a computer <laughs> yeah. that could have done that a lot faster. <laughs> Clearly being sarcastic. Okay. <laughs> um, so for, for our example's purposes, let's just say you bet $20. And your opponent calls. And now the turn is the nine of spades. So the board now, ace of hearts, nine of hearts, six of diamonds, nine of spades. 
How do we feel about that turn card? So the, they were on the button, right? They just slide it on the button Correct. from our under the gun plus two. What do you guys think? Let's see. Chris is deciding if he's going to comment or not. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think it's, you know, if we're still targeting that ace, um, it's a pretty ugly card because, I mean, I think a lot of people are going to call that bet to with with a nine. Um, and then at the same time, your, your ace king is starting to be, get, you know, get a little bit less valuable. Um, so I, I it, it makes me, yeah, I, I would be nervous about it. John, did you have something? Well, I was just going to say the, I mean, when the nine comes, obviously that makes it less likely that the opponent held one in his hand just from a card removal point of view. Um, and I don't think it's that bad of a card for us. I think it's better than another Broadway card because a lot of our opponent's range that's going to stick with us would be an ace with the Broadway. So it's better than a heart, it. too, I would yeah, argue. Definitely better than a heart. Rob, did you have anything? Well, I was just going to say, I think we're still uh, targeting that ace queen. Um, this didn't change anything from that standpoint. Yeah, and I think an important thing to recognize here is he's still going to have an ace more often than he has a nine. Right. I mean, so now we're looking at two aces, the one on the board and the one in our hand, and we're also looking at two nines, the two on the board. So card removal wise, there's there's the same effect going on. Two of the two of the aces and two of the nines are accounted for. But just in terms of hands that your opponent is likely to play pre flop, there are a lot more hands that people are gonna call with that have an ace in them than the people are gonna call with that have a nine in them. You know, he's probably calling with ace queen offsuit. He may not be calling with queen nine offsuit. He's probably calling with ace five suited. He may not be calling with nine five suited. So there's, you know, even if we think it's equally likely based on, on, you know, the flop play and the cards that we're looking at that he could have an ace or a nine. If we think about what kinds of hands is he likely to play pre-flop, he's still going to have the ace more often than he has the nine. It may be true that the value of our hand has diminished a bit on this turn card, but I don't think the overall goal changes or i don't think the target changes right we're still still want to think about ace queen ace queen is still um a hand that should be willing to put some money into the pot it's still a hand that the opponent could very plausibly have there's plenty of other hands that look very much like ace queen that are going to play very much like ace queen so yeah i, I think you guys are right that we want to um keep the focus on ace queen well, and if, he, if he has a marginally made hand too don't you think that's a good card for us too that he gets I mean, if he got if he's getting sticky with sevens and eights and tens or that sort of thing that he didn't three bet with, you know, that's, it's a good card that he's going to, he's going to feel good about it. If he's ahead on the flop, he's ahead on the turn. He may. Um, I mean, I think the, the prospects for winning a lot more money from hands like pocket eights and pocket sevens are relatively poor. I think, yeah. uh, I mean, he, sh- he should be changing his assessment of his hand, not only based on the board texture, but based on our actions as well. Once so every time, player. exactly. Every time we bet, those eights and sevens should be looking less and less appealing to him, regardless of what the the turn cards are. I mean, you're right that like a king or a queen would would maybe be you know, worse for him than a nine. Although you know a nine does increase the likelihood that he loses to king jack because he can get counterfeited if the river is an ace, then you know he loses to king jack. Uh, so it's yep. it's not the very best card for him either. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think basically those are just. I mean, if they come along to a bet, great. But I think they're not the hand we want to focus on because. Yep there's a decent chance no matter what we do, he's just not putting more money in the pot with that hand. Got it. Um, so I, I think the better play here is to bet, but the hero in our example uh, doesn't have our intestinal fortitude. And <laughs> he checks. The opponent checks behind. Is, is that intestinal fortitude or is that checking to induce? That's an interesting question. Um yeah, there could be a case for, for checking to induce here. Uh, or I, I think it's worth, let me put it a, a different way. I think it's worth explaining why I don't think checking to induce is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think that's not, it, it's a good example of why we have a value target. So it, the, the reason when we say induce, what, what are we trying to induce? Well, we're trying to get, our, get his ace-10 and ace-jack to feel really good about their hand. We're trying to induce him to, to bet turn there. Or if he has something like a pocket tens or pocket eights or something like that where he got sticky and, uh, you know, 
uh, now we're underrepresenting in our hand. He might think he's actually betting for value or, you know, maybe he's got a seven, eight sort of hand that he's going to turn into a semi bluff. Yeah. I think that that last is, is really what I thought you had in mind when you said induce is that we, we might be trying to induce a bluff by checking. I think if, if we're thinking about getting money to go in the pot when our opponent has ace queen, ace jack, ace 10, I think betting is going to be the better way of accomplishing that. I mean, you could certainly construct opponent profiles where, you know, if you just stipulate, you know, this guy feels really good when he's checked to and he has top pair and he doesn't feel good when you bet and he has top pair, okay, like against that player, checking would be better. But I mean, mathematically, there's good reason why he should be more willing to put money in the pot. So if you, even if you made a pot size bet on the turn, he's going to be getting two to one odds when he holds a hand like ace queen or, you know, Mm -hmm. ace 10 or whatever. So he only has to win the pot 33% of the time to justify calling. If you check and he has the choice of either betting or checking behind, the only reason he would prefer betting is if he expects to win the pot more than 50% of the time, right? I mean, if he has a choice of not putting money in the pot or putting it in the pot, he would only want to put it in the pot if he's a favorite to win it. So his threshold for putting money in the pot after you check should be higher than his threshold for putting money into the pot after you bet. He just, he needs to win more often. And I mean, there are people, I mean, so the other danger of checking when he has like ace 10 is even if he bets the turn, he might just check back the river. In fact, he probably will. So, you know, you would have to either, you could check raise the turn or you could check call the turn and then lead out on the river. But like, you would have to do something like once you give up the betting lead, you would have to do something to take back the betting lead or else you risk allowing him to check back the river. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of times people, and I know I'm, I'm not putting these words in your mouth, but people talk a lot about checking for pot control. And I think even as the imposition player, you, before the river, you really don't have perfect control over the pot. Cause even if you check back the flop, your opponent could still like overbet the turn for instance, but especially as the out of position player, what you're really doing when you check, you're not controlling the pot. You're giving control of the pot to your opponent. Mm. And you're saying to him, here, you play the size pot that you want to play. If you want to play a large pot, either because you have a really strong hand or because you're going to bluff, um, go ahead. You can do that. And if you'd rather play a small pot, which is what your opponent should want when he has a hand like pocket 10s or ace 10, he really should be trying to get to showdown more so than he should be trying to make the pot larger. Uh, And you're, you're making that easy on him by checking. So, I mean, this is why we have a value target, because I think checking might well be the best play if our opponent had, say, jack 10 of hearts. If we could induce him to bluff with that hand and then we could get in a raise, that would be very appealing. But if our opponent has ace queen, ace jack, ace 10, I think betting is the better play. And, you know, we picked our value target to help us make decisions like this. Right. That's what I was going to say. So that's where that value target idea comes in very handy because you've, exactly. you've chosen a line based on it. So don't deviate from that line. You're trying to get, get max value from that particular hand. And he's given us no reason to think otherwise. Exactly. Uh, I like it. Um, but yeah, in, in our example, the hero does check behind and the river is the six of hearts. So our final board is <laughs> ace of hearts, nine of hearts, six of diamonds, uh, nine, nine of spades, six of hearts. So perfect, now, perfect exactly. run out. <laughs> we're, we're losing to the nines. We're losing to the sixes. We're losing to the flushes. Hearts. What do you want to do? But I can say it's queen. We're still good. Still queen. <laughs> what do you guys think? Any, any thoughts from you guys out there? So we've gone. So did you, it went check, check on turn, right? Check, check, turn. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I tend to bet for value here. I think. Yeah. I think uh, we, we still have our target, right? Our value target is ace queen. We've been, taking that line the whole way. So I think we continue to take that line and we, we bet out here. I, I just think he's going to bet a nine on the turn. Uh, and I also think he's probably, I mean, loose passive. So I guess I don't know. Everybody has a different interpretation of that, but I mean, I would think on a flush draw, they might bet the turn there yeah, as well. I so when, the, when they check back, I think they're trying to get to a showdown cheap. So I don't, I don't think it's a nine and I probably don't think it's a hard draw either. So I think I'm betting for value on the river. Yeah, that, that's that's uh, excellent hand reading. I think even if we can't be sure that he doesn't have a flush, you know, I, I don't I don't think we could say, uh, you know, n- no one would be shocked to see a flush here. Um, but you know, p- poker is not about being sure; it's about 
making sort of uh, educated guesses or deductions based on the limited information that we have. And yeah, we should recognize if he had a hand with no showdown value, a hand like 8-7 or jack-10 of hearts that can't really win unless it improves, he had incentive to bet the turn with that hand. He, you know... He also had some incentive to to check, but there's reason to believe that you know at least sometimes he might bet the turn. And so those hands, like he had more incentive to bet eight seven, I would argue, than he had to bet say ace ten. So even though both hands are still possible for him, I think relatively speaking, the ace ten becomes a little more likely when he checks the turn, and the eight seven or the uh, the jack ten of hearts, those become a little less likely when he checks the turn. Yeah. Um. The other thing to, to consider here, and uh, you guys actually, you, you foiled me a little bit because nobody, nobody fell for the trap. Uh, a lot of times when I share, th- this hand has similarity to a hand that I use in, um, in my in actually my very first coaching session that I tend to do with people. And uh, it, it's kind of constructed to walk people into a trap. And I think because we had the value targeting conversation, or I mean, maybe you guys are just good. I shouldn't assume that I, <laughs> but um, in, in any event, you, you guys steered clear of the trap. A lot of people's inclination on the river here is to check and call. And um, the, the reason they like to do that, I think, is that they don't have a lot of confidence in their hand. And so they think, well, you know, I, I bet my strong hands. And then the way to play medium strength hands is, is you check and, and call bets. So I would actually take checking and calling off the table. I think you either want to bet this hand or check and fold. And I mean, checking and folding, it goes along with that, that you'll often win when the pot goes check, check. But um, I actually think it's kind of, I mean, so the reason to check and call, just like we talked about on the turn, the reason to check and call would be to induce bluffs. And I just, you know, I don't think bluffs are very likely in this situation. The most obvious draw got there. Um, you know, eight seven is a draw that missed. Uh, there's some gut shot draws that missed. If you think your opponent might have a hand like ten seven of spades or something, I mean, there are some draws he could have. But the decision that you face on the river, similar to what we talked about on the turn, is if if you're gonna put a bet in the pot one way or the other. If you're if you're thinking, well, I'm either you know, if I do check, I'm gonna call a bet anyway. You're not really saving yourself money. Like the reason people will give for why they want to check the river is I'm afraid he might have a flush. I'm afraid he might have a full house. Well, I mean, you're paying that hand off if you check and call a bet. So you're not saving yourself any money. Assuming that you fold to a raise when you bet, which I think you should, then you're not really saving any money by checking and calling. Again, you're just giving the control to the opponent. You're saying when you have a hand that wants a free showdown, like ace-10, go ahead and take your free showdown. When you have a hand that wants to make the pot larger, like a full house or a flush, go ahead and make the pot larger. (laughs) You're, You're giving the choice to him. So if you're going to put the bet in the pot one way or the other, you should actually just forget about the possibility of your opponent having the flush or the full house. I mean, assuming that you know we're going to fold if raised. The, the decision of whether to bet or check call has nothing to do with whether your opponent has a flush or a full house. We, we just have to accept we're going to pay those hands off one way or the other. Hmm, that's, I, really, I really like that, that a lot just because, yeah, I mean, if, if, we're a, if they have ace-jack or ace-10 and it goes check-check, we lose all that value that we would have had. Exactly. And if, and if we're going to call one street anyway... Exactly. Uh, you know, with a losing hand, uh, we, we don't save ourselves any money there either either way. So that's, that's an interesting take. Uh, John, did you have a comment? I was just going to say basically the same thing. By betting, you are maximizing your value. A check, on the other hand, minimizes your value. And uh, if assuming bet sizing is the same between the two of you, you're going to be losing the same amount either way. Mm-hmm. Not only that, but you might get some of the weaker flushes to fold maybe if you bet oh unlikely though yeah i I wouldn't count on that i mean if 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 we're if we're hoping that he calls with a worse ace i think uh, i mean this is actually a disagreement that nate and i've had on the air a few times uh, a co-host of my podcast um about whether it makes sense to think in terms of two-way bets right a bet where um, like some percentage of the of the poker population will pay off with a hand worse than yours, and some percent might actually fold a hand better than yours. I mean, in theory, there's no reason that can't be true. But like, I can't imagine. Like, I can't think of a single time in my poker career when I ever like made a bet that I was when I was thinking of it in those terms. Like, I just don't think it's a strategically useful concept to think about. I'm betting here, hoping that my opponent both calls with hands weaker than mine, but also folds hands stronger than mine. Like, that would take a very bizarre sort of opponent to uh to do that chris did you have anything yeah are we thinking about this river the same way if as 
we were talking about we should like maybe we should have bet the turn and the turn gets called what, what are we thinking about this river now that's a good question um i think the the fundamental framework for thinking about it will be the same although we might well arrive at a different conclusion um so i think the the decision like at least if we're choosing between betting versus checking and calling, then the framework we would want to use is to think um, essentially the, the, those are just two different lines that target different portion of his range. So betting targets the, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about inducing bluffs, right? Which is what we do by checking. If we're checking, we're targeting the weakest part of his range and we're trying to induce bluffs, assuming we're planning on calling. Um, if we bet, we're trying to induce bluff catches. And I think that's something we should talk about a lot more as, as poker players, because especially when you're playing against, as you're like your average opponent, especially your average live opponent, is too loose and too passive. And so you really should be thinking more often about inducing bluff catches and thinking less about inducing bluffs. Um, so if, if you're thinking about betting versus check calling on the river, really you should just be thinking, is my opponent more likely to make calling mistakes or is my opponent more likely to make bluffing mistakes? Now, the, the wrinkle... Um, Chris, with the situation that, that you brought up is we might not want to check and call the river. We might decide that at this point, our hand actually is like, it's not even a favorite. Like we don't want to put another bet into the pot, in which case we would check planning to fold and expecting that the action will often go check, check and we'll win. Like maybe, I don't know, 25 or 30% of the time it goes check, check and we'd be the dominated ace. But you know, if, if we think that flushes and full houses make up a large enough part of his range that we just don't want to put another bat in the pot, then we might not be in that choice of um, inducing bluffs versus inducing bluff catches. We might just be in the, in the neighborhood of like, our hand isn't good anymore. Or we could get really fancy and try to check raise the river to represent us as well. <laughs> but I, I don't recommend that. Trying to bluff your opponents off of flushes and full houses is not a good idea. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> that moment when you're representing what the other guy has, that's one of my, that'll be one of the chapters of my book, just like drawing dead and getting there. That's one of my favorites and winning small and losing big. Those are my, the three chapters I know I'll be writing in my book. The, well, the draw <laughs> oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say that drawing dead and getting there is actually that it's a, it's a topic I've been thinking about a lot recently. And it's another one that, I mean, it, it's sort of a more advanced application of game theory than what I really get into in my book. But, um, you know, the, the value of holding a draw on early streets, like when we're thinking about what hands do we want to check raise the flop with, um, I think most people kind of understand that it's nice to have a draw when you're bluffing on an early street. But something that I've only recently started thinking rigorously about is um, how likely is your draw to be good if it gets there? Right. So, you know, like bluffing with a straight draw when there's three hearts on the board, not that appealing. Or even, you know, having a, a, a backdoor flush draw or a low flush draw when, I mean, those are, the, the value of making those is much less than the value. Like if there's going to be four hearts on the board when you make your flush, especially if it's not the nut flush, like that's not that valuable to hand to end up making. I mean, it's still good. Like it's a good outcome for you if you were bluffing and then you river a flush. Like that's nice. Right. But it's not that nice. Um, and it really makes a big difference. Like how live are your outs going to be if they actually get there? Even just like the, the, the pair cards in your hand, you know, bluffing with king queen on 10 9 x instead of bluffing with 7 6 on 10 9 x you know, right. they're both gut shots but the difference between what's it worth to hit a king versus what's it worth to hit a seven is pretty huge my my hand of choice for the drawing dead and getting there is the nut flush draw on a paired board that's yeah. been that's sort of been my my hand of choice for drawing dead and getting there yep. uh rivering that nut flush on the river on a paired board uh, well andrew it's, it's already uh time uh which is crazy time just flies by and I do want to honor your time. So I appreciate you coming on. But any guess, any final words of wisdom to uh, Rec Poker Nation as far as, you know, we're all trying to learn the game. We're all trying to grow together in community. Uh, we're, we're all looking for wisdom from wherever we can find it. And obviously, you're a tremendous source of that. And you have been to the poker community for many years. But uh, any kind of final parting words for us as we uh, go forward? Uh, I got two. One uh, is listen to the Thinking Poker podcast. Nice. Uh, and the second one is, and I'll, I'll try to make explicit something that we were doing in this hand that was important, uh, which is you want to be as explicit and as specific as you can about what you're trying to accomplish with any action that you take, whether it's a bet 
or a check or a raise or a call or whatever. Uh, and so when I say specific and explicit, yeah, it's nice to say I'm checking to induce a bet. It's better to say I'm checking to induce a bluff. It's even better to say I'm checking to induce a bluff from Jack Ten of Hearts. Like the, the more um, explicit that you can be, because I think a lot of times, you know, when people just say I'm checking to induce a bluff, what they they miss situations where their opponent just isn't very likely to have a bluff. And I think like the hand example that we just talked about is a good one where by the time he gets to the river, there just aren't that many weak hands. This would be even more true if the river had been say the five of hearts. So it completes the straight draw and the flush draw. If you just say, I'm checking to induce a bluff, you know, you're going to miss something. Whereas if you force yourself to articulate, well, what exactly is the hand he could have that he would be bluffing with? Like, what is the weak hand that called the flop, called the turn, and now has no showdown value on the river and chooses to bluff with it? Once you force yourself to articulate it in that way, you find yourself struggling to identify oh, gee, what, what hand would it make sense for him to bluff with? You start to realize, well, maybe I shouldn't be calling here. Like, if I'm, if I'm, if the only hand I can beat is the bluff and bluffs aren't very likely for him, uh, maybe I should fold, and you, know, they, I, you you come to the right play that way. So it's specific and explicit goals. Good stuff. Well, yeah, Thinking Poker Podcast. Check it out, you guys. Fount of wisdom. And Andrew, let me know when uh, when your book is available, and we will make sure we we send a link out to the crew on that as well. And best wishes at the World Series this summer. Thank you very much, guys. It was a pleasure talking to you. You asked some uh, some some good questions. Oh, we, we, love, we love to dialogue, we love to break down hands, and we love to get different perspectives. So thanks to you. And uh, yeah, so feel free to sign off whenever you're ready. We're going to con- continue the conversation here. But uh, seriously, great, uh, great stuff. I really appreciate it. All right, good talking to you guys. Good night, fellas. Take care. Oh, and thank you. I, I saw some, uh, some, some kind chat notifications popping up. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar enough with Zoom to see how to, how to call them. Oh, wait, here we go. Uh, so thanks to uh, Eric. Thank you for the, uh, the kind words. Take care, guys. Oh. I would have passed it on if I would have seen it, but I missed it. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Eric. All right, guys. Well, uh, well, we can start the conversation. What do you guys think? Any feedback, key takeaways? And then any of the attendees that are out there, Doug, Eric, George, Jack, John, Chris, uh, if you guys want to uh, be promoted to panelists to chat, uh, just raise your hand or throw something in the chat, and I will uh, promote you to panelists. Rob, what do you think? I just love listening to him talk. He, the way the way he looks at hands, the way he looks at the whole process, is just. Uh, I just. I think he's really one of the best. Was was this? I mean, was anything surprise you based on all the episodes you've listened to his other podcasts? Is this pretty consistent? Yeah, it's very very consistent. He you know he always talks about um, that last step, the last uh, break, or conversation he had there about well, what is he bluffing with? You know, and that's something that I don't, I don't do, you know, I just, well, I'm going to do some bluff. I got an ace high, ace king. I'm going to do some bluff, right? Well, what hand could he possibly have? And you don't, you don't go that deep. You don't think that deep and, and you need to, you need to understand that. And I, he says that all the time on his podcast when he's talking uh, strategy with Nate, with, with Nate Mavis. So yeah, it's very, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Chris? Chris? Yeah, no, I, I, I love listening to him too. I just, I feel like he's got just, he's so sharp about the game. And this, this idea of the value targeting thing is one that I, I both really want to get better at, but I also struggle with too. Like the thing that I struggle with that I'm trying to think about and maybe people can weigh in is, you know, I've often heard when you get a hand like this with a flop with an ace nine, six, and you've got ace king, one of the things you're trying to do is like charge the draws, right? Like you, you bet to charge the draws. And this seems like another way of thinking about it is like, well, forget about the draws. It's like, what's the best case scenario and what's my line against that best case scenario. And sort of like, I'm trying to figure out, well, how do you balance um, that line of thinking with that idea that kind of charge the draw sort of line of thinking that I think comes up a lot. I totally agree. I, I love it. You know, it's like, what are you betting for? You're betting for protection. You want to charge the draws, you know, the seven eights or the guy that's got King nine, you want to make him pay for staying there with the nine or his pocket tens. And uh, there is still merit, I think in that, in that piece, but to say, yeah, let's target a hand that we want to try to maximize value on. I think it's a very interesting approach. And and I do like the, um, the, the idea behind it of let's simplify the game. Cause uh, you know, that's sort of the, what we want to do, right? When it's an incredibly complex game and how do we simplify it? Uh, but yet still not lose sight of the fact that obviously ace queen is not the one hand he could have here. 
So it's kind of both. Like I, I like the idea of thinking about it as, okay, this is the hand that I'm going to target to determine my line for the hand. Kind of like, and then combine that with like the way Peyton thought about things in last week's episode uh, you know, where, where he's thinking about, okay, here's the flop. I want to think about what I'm going to do in the turn in the river. And so you can kind of say right now, I'm going to assume it's ace queen, which means I'm going to play it this way. And then until he gives me reason to think something differently. So to me, it's kind of combining those two things of saying, what's the hand we want to target for max value, which determines the line we're going to take. And then also keeping in mind, I guess the whole, the other hands that he could possibly have. I thought it was fascinating. Well, I think it also, it, if you're looking at maximizing your value for ace queen, a side effect of that is you will be charging the draws. Yeah, right. So the the two are kind of compatible. No, that's that's for sure. Good point. And I, and I just like the idea of, you know, I've, I've heard somebody else say, I don't remember who it was, if they were on the episode or somewhere else, but just, you know, the, the most value you can get is just keep betting it all, all every street. You know, if you have a good made hand, just bet it every street. And and I think maybe it was Alex Fitzgerald or something, but, you know, because I tend to overthink it a little bit. Like I get called on a flop, then the, the nine comes on the turn. And of course, the guy must have a nine. He was calling me a second pair. What else could he possibly have? Now he's got trips. Now I'm beat. You know, so I started doing this whole pot control thing, which I think there is some merit in. But yeah, I just lost a ton of value against ace, queen, ace, jack, ace, ten. How do you- nope. Stace, you just muted again. Or something happened. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> how do you how do you throw that in with what Chris Fox Wallace teaches about chunking? And you know, that seems like a little different approach where you're kinda of going, Okay, he's gonna chunk his range into three different areas, or do we target one hand or which is easier, which is appropriate? Any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I was trying to reconcile that a little bit too, because hand ranging is still dynamic and I think there's still the chunking piece. It feels like Andrew's saying, I mean, he didn't say this explicitly, but, you know, he is still sort of chunking it or whatever, but just saying, I'm going to choose the one chunk that I can get the maximum value from, and that's how I'm going to determine my line until they force me to think of the the reality that maybe he's in another chunk of hands. That's kind of how I think about it. He didn't say it that way, but that's kind of mm-hmm. how I'm thinking about it. Like, if all of a sudden, you know, you start getting, he starts showing hyperaggression, you got to start saying, well, maybe he's in the other chunk that has me crushed, but until he does anything to prove otherwise, I'm going to assume he's in the chunk that I can value bet. And if he's, he's almost like saying too, like if he's in the chunk that is just a, a complete whiff, yeah, I might misvalue by not giving him the chance to bluff. But if I bet and he folds, that's not a horrible result either. So that's how I'm kind of reconciling it. But I think that's a, exactly, I feel like we're learning the stuff about hand ranging and chunks and all this stuff. And now it's like, okay, let's pick one hand to target. But I don't, I think he's really saying, uh, sort of a, a default line that we're going to take the rest of the hand is this one hand that we can maximize value, but then we're going to be ready to adjust and still keep the broader ranging in, in mind. Does that make yeah, sense, Stacey? Or what are you thinking that about? It might there? be a little simpler for, especially for yeah. rec poker players that, I mean, cause chunking gets a little vague for me, you know, when, when you just kind of say, Oh, the lower end of his range. Well, <laughs> I don't really like he's saying, Make yourself say it out loud. What exactly does that mean? What what exactly hands name two hands that <laughs> are in that range, and that's harder. Whereas here, if you force yourself, at least you're thinking about ace queen, then ace jack and ace ten kind of come fairly easily from that. Then, then if you're if he, what am I trying to say? If he he makes a move that says he's obviously not in that line, he's in a different line like the nines or something. Okay. Right. Now I can move to there. Now what, what else may be there? And just like you said, move to a whole different chunk at that point. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. How do I play against that chunk? Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. When we talked last week or last Thursday, we were talking about ranges. Um, one of the things that he had us think about was what does the bottom of that range look like? Right. And Andrew really didn't go there. Andrew went to what is the portion of that range that you want to target where you're going to get the most money from. Right. So he was more looking at what is the top of that range that you want to target. So it's kind of almost an opposite approach. I suppose until he made a move that made Andrew think differently and go, okay, what is, what would the bottom of that range be? And is it possible that they had, what was it? 10, seven or something in that last example um, where he would have hit the straight, something like that. You know, 
Oh, when if you, he, when he changed the river card, like if he changed it to a five of hearts or something. Yeah. Yeah. Where, 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 if that would have, if that would have forced, you know, made him now, now we're wondering if he's hitting a 10, seven, you're going wait, but we didn't really have that in his range to start with. So you know, maybe, maybe Andrew would go at that point to start doing what Fox was talking about, looking at the lower end of the range. What do you think? I think, I think part of the reason why he did that is in this particular flop, I mean, we flopped really strong with our hand. Yeah. And so there's less, we're not that concerned about being beat. So yeah. we're not as concerned about protecting ourselves against our opponent's range. Instead, we're trying to look at the chunk where we can maximize our EV of the hand because it is a strong flop. I think if we had a more medium flop, mm. it would have been a very different conversation. Mm. And looking at the same approach, I think because there's a corollary to, to looking at how do you maximize your value. Yeah. There's all, the corollary is how do you minimize getting value owned? Well, with this particular uh, flop and our hand, the value owned portion of it is not really big. And it's one of those kind of cold deck situations. If we do happen to hit it. Hmm. How do you, so like, I mean, that's, that was, I was my next question is sort of like, how do you approach this idea of value targeting when you do have like either, let's say we had a, a nine on this flop. Like we had, we had King nine and it comes ace nine, six, or we have seven, eight of hearts, you know, and we've got a big combo draw. Like, do we, do we take this same approach or is it only when we hit value Great question. that we're looking for this kind of moment to value target something? Yeah. I was thinking the same thing. Like what if we have ACE 10 here? Same. It's almost kind of the same kind of thing, right? Yeah. What do you guys think? Well, you do the same thing. If, if you have ACE 10, you say, well, what if they have ACE nine? How, how do I play this to get the most value? And then, but you still have to, of course, if they have ace king or ace queen, then then you have to right. Or like Chris is king nine. Like, what do you do against if you have king nine here? What do you target? What uh, you, you yeah. got to ask me? What what hands are you targeting? Are you really targeting uh, uh, trying to get value from something with your nine when there's a ace on the board? I think yeah. more with middle, middle pair. I uh, I use it more for defense. If I have king nine. And he bets into me. I say, would King Eight really do this, or or would a Queen Nine do this? And uh, I use it more for defense. And say, well, do I have the best hand? The best way to do that is to pick the hand one less than yours and see if it makes sense. And what about like Seven Eight of Hearts? You know, right. what do you, what what is that? Are you just are you? Th this is a bluff, and so we're not really value targeting anything, um, even though we got a big combo draw. Or I mean, what is? How is this? How does this concept work with that? I don't know. <laughs> um, Andrew, um, Andrew, yeah, I've got one more question for you. Um, no, I mean that's it. Like, I mean, you start to target. I think you're targeting now hands that you're that are ahead of you that you want to fold. I mean, right. part, the big combo draw. You're almost. Are you building up? You're, it's a semi bluff. You're kind of. You're you're targeting those hands that you're just trying. A fold is fine. You know, maybe even weak aces. Maybe you're saying, okay, if they call me with ace seven. You know, how do I do I target that hand and kind of hope that they can get them to fold or a nine? Am I trying to get that to fold? Yeah, yeah, it's different than saying how do I maximize value? I feel like now you're starting to target those weak made hands that you're trying to get to fold out. I would say it's a good question. Yeah, you could be trying to fold out those pocket pairs like pocket eights, uh, pocket tens, you know, pocket jacks, even. Um, ace looks pretty scary if you're the pre flop raiser. And he, I, the guy was in the on the button that call, right? right? Yeah, he sat in the button. Yep. So he could be very wide there on the button, just floating. So yeah, if you're semi bluffing there, you're looking to fold out those uh, bigger draws, maybe even or uh, or those pocket pairs. Yeah, and I'm trying to think how it, how it plays into that targeting thing, uh, because I mean, it, you know, it's such a good spot to like check raise. You know, so it, that's not, I don't know if that's targeting something or what that is. Like, if you were to say, I'm going to check raise with my big combo draw here. Yeah, because the way Andrew talked about it was that, you know, you want to figure out in your dream scenario, what is the hand you want them to have? But when you've <laughs> right. got one of these big combo draws, you, I mean, the only thing you, that you could possibly be targeting is something that's beating you, right? With seven, eight of hearts. 
I mean, there's nobody else. <laughs> right. there's no way you're being called unless you're being beat. Yeah, five um, four hearts. What do you want to have here? Maybe. So I, yeah, I just I, I I that's where I'm yeah. trying to figure out the. Con- I love the concept, but I'm trying to figure it out in terms of different situations. That's a tremendous question. I don't know. If you, I don't know if the if the concept is still there that you're still targeting a hand, or if it turns to a different sort of perspective. Right. Uh, that's a good question. Do you guys, those of you who listen to all the all of Andrew's stuff, do you have any insight on that, or have you picked up on anything? Three hundred hours, Rob, and you can't give us more than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, he what he's gonna what he's probably gonna say what he's what he's probably gonna say is. Um, you're going to be targeting that you're going to be targeting a weak ace or one of those medium pocket pairs like eights or tens. Um, that's the only, that's the only thing that you're going to be able to get to fold. A big ace is not going to fold to your continuation bet. So it doesn't you know, necessarily always have to be your dream scenario. It can be something you're targeting something that's beating you. Correct. Right. Okay. Correct. You're not always. Yeah. It's just like on when he was targeting ace queen, he was ignoring the fact that the guy could have had a had a nine, right? Right. right. When the nine came, he still was looking at ace queen was his target. He wasn't looking at the guy poss- possibly having a nine. So it's the same type of scenario. If the guy's got ace king, you're not going to get rid of him. So you're targeting those hands that you think will could fold with a semi block. Other thoughts, guys. Those so you can wrap it up. I know it's been a long, a long night. Any parting words? Anybody want to put a put a bow on this on this package? Yeah, I'm still waiting to see my picture up behind you. <laughs> yeah, I gotta get some. I gotta get stuff up there. I know. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, thank you so much to Andrew. Thank you so much to the Rec Poker panel. Uh, you guys are fantastic. Uh, I love the community that we're building here, part of Rec Poker Nation. Uh, learning and growing our game together in an interactive and dynamic and fun way. So uh, appreciate all of you all that are part of that deal. Uh, Running Aces, thank you for continuing to be our sponsor. Looking forward to more great things on the horizon with you guys. Um, And go out to recpokertraining.com. Sign up for the newsletter. Uh, Support us through Patreon. Subscribe and rate and review us on iTunes. Those are all things that you can do to really encourage the work that we're doing and try to expand uh, Rec Poker Nation more widely. And that's all appreciated, of course. So with that, until next week, good luck on and off the felt.